the story goes, he was looking for an OX5 engine and went to a uh, auction in Idaho. And all the engines, they had several OX5 engines, they're all going for way too much money. You know, they're going left for like $50 each and, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they didn't have all the parts on them and uh, it was not going well. And then Tom said, Terry, nobody's paying any attention to this pusher over here in the corner and it's got an engine on it. So why don't we get that and that way we'll get the engine. And uh, Sure enough, no one was interested, I suspect, because if you just buy an engine, you can throw it in the back of your pickup. If you buy this thing, it doesn't go in the back of your pickup. So I'm going to show you what it looked like when it arrived here. Let's see, I'll just start and go ahead and pass it. It was pretty tough looking, and the outer wing panels were gone. So about... Uh, after, after they got the thing back, got to looking into the history of the thing and decided, you know, this is a fairly interesting airplane. Instead of just taking the engine off and jumping the rest of it, maybe one day in the future we should think about building it, building it back. So about, uh, when would it have been? 2005 or six came up when we got some wings. And then the decision is, you know, this airplane's had a million lifetimes with different configurations. And one of the last configurations that had Jenny wings and interplane ailerons. That's the ailerons are these surfaces right here between the two wings. Now just one of the, just before that it, or after that it had Jenny wings with the ailerons in the wing itself. But the decision was made to rebuild this thing with the interplane ailerons, jetty wings, and uh, so that they've got the wings with no ailerons in the wing itself. And, okay, now the other thing is, this looks an awful lot like a, uh, a Curtis airplane but Mr. Parker said it's not. And Curtis, when he built these things, these were made out of bamboo, which is actually fairly strong. But Billy Parker, who's a designer of this one, decided he wanted to have an airplane you could do loops in. This is called a Parker looping biplane. So he wanted it stronger. And so he wanted the tail end made out, or the, I guess you'd call that the empennage system made out of tubing. Uh, Mr. Parker's son is still alive and uh, he was here when we rolled the thing out of the hangar. Uh, so anyway, then it was about, then the, the Ludwig family, as are many of us, had money that they didn't know what to do with and they were looking for a place to get rid of it so they decided that they would give Wham a grant to rebuild the airplane. So that was, uh, well, last January. A year ago. Yeah, just about a year ago. So we got the thing out, and uh, then we had to start taking a look at what we had compared to what we were gonna end up with. Let me start another set of pictures around to you. We gotta take the thing down to bare bones. I'll send two pictures, I think. No. Every piece that you can see on this airplane had a yellow tag attached to it with a label saying what it is. And so in the restoration hangar was just totally full of yellow tags and cryptic notes. Fortunately, we were able to decipher most of them when it came time to put it back together. So let me talk a little bit about the ownership that we know of. Airplanes were not registered with the then CAA, now it's been called the FAA, until the 30s. So the first ownership known on this airplane is 1934. It was registered to Billy Parker, who's the designer. It's a 1914 design, 
So somewhere between 1914 and 1934, it was built. And in the, the first iteration, it had what I would, uh, what appeared to be almost the Wright Brothers wing profiles, not these Jenny wings. Much more bottom camber than these have. And then it's had at least three different wing systems and two or three different flight control systems. Everything has been relatively conventional. But one of the uh, early, I don't know, some of these terms you may not, if you don't know what the terms are, let me know. I've even seen uh, some early pushers where the control yoke or the wheel turned the rudder instead of the ailerons. But this airplane is very much conventional. That, that yoke controls the ailerons, the rudder is by a, a, a bar down below, a rudder bar, and then back and forth to the elevators, which are here. Okay, the rest of the thing, uh, it went from Billy Parker to Paul Mance, who is a movie stunt pilot. And uh, then he joined up with another guy called Tallman, and they were still in the movie business, it was the, the uh, Tallman's, Tallman's combination company. And then, I think it was in bad shape by the time it goes to a, an outfit called Rosen Novak Auto Company. At that point, I think we're, we're looking at not much of an airplane anymore. Then it went to a couple other folks. It went to a guy, Turtling, in Idaho, and then Terry Bryant bid on it to get the engine and actually ended up with the airplane itself. So, yeah, a year ago, a few volunteers started on this thing. About 35 people. If you see them wearing these orange t-shirts at any time, they're, they're the folks who, who took care of all this, putting all the pieces together and getting things found, located, and identified. So, and then we spent quite a bit of time trying to find pictures because some of the airplane was not there. And so, you have to look at, we don't have drawings that really have dimensions on them, so we're looking at pictures to rebuild the elevator and, and horizontal stabilizer. And so what we end up with is, is an airplane with the Jenny wings, and, and for those aerodynamicists in the crowd, that's a Eiffel 36 airfoil. And I assume that's the same Eiffel that designed the Eiffel Tower. Uh, we've got about uh, 340 square feet of wing. It weighs 1,400 pounds. The wings have most biplanes, you'll notice that the top wing is ahead of the bottom wing. It's called stagger. And occasionally you see them this way with what they call negative stagger. This airplane has no stagger. The, air, the wings do not tip up, so there's no dihedral. It's just totally perfectly square. And again, for aerodynamics, uh, the center of gravity turns out to be at about 39% of the mean aerodynamic cord, which is Quite a ways aft compared to the way designers would design today. Today it would be 20% uh, aft would be a. Uh, so that would lead us to believe, lead me to believe, that this airplane is going to be slightly unstable in pitch. And but wing loading at five pounds per square foot, it's not going to not going to be a high speed airplane. Now, the engine, you'll note, is a Curtis OX5 water-cooled V8 and probably worth a presentation all on its own. It is a really unique engine, and it's got several characteristics that are, are fun to deal with. But it gets that horsepower at 1,400 RPM. Most engines today and airplanes are fairly slow turning, and they get 22, 2300 RPM. So this is very slow turning, and that's the reason for this big, wide propeller back there. It's not going to go very fast. 
it, uh, they have gained a little bit in terms of efficiency. Today, you probably burn about nine gallons an hour in a 150 horsepower engine. This is nine gallons an hour in 90 horsepower. Um, and without any water or oil, it weighs 380 pounds. So the weight of this thing is that engine and the fat pilot that flew it. <laughs> I did, just as a matter of interest, I did do some airfoil analyses, differences between this wing and a Clark Y, which is a Clark Y, is, that's fair to St. Louis had a Clark Y. The Cub isn't a Clark Y, but it's almost. Yeah. yeah it's nearly exactly the same. You find this wing, uh, generates almost as much lift, but its stall is much sharper, realizing you're looking at these things on, on computer simulations, which leave a lot to be desired in a way. But again, that's what you would expect. That this airplane will stall quickly and not give you much warning ahead of time. Because of the FCG, the general feeling of this test pilot is he's not going to get close to the stall if he can avoid it because FCGs tend to get you into a situation where the airplane stays in a stall and doesn't want to recover. Anybody you know, stall is a funny word. I like the French word, they say unhook. So when you get too much pitch up, and the air is hitting the thing at the bottom of the wing too much, all of a sudden the lift disappears and the wing, as the French say, unhooks and drops. Okay, this carburetor is out in the free breeze underneath everything. And we discovered uh, early on in some taxi tests that it is prone to icing. <laughs> and the reason the carburetor is ice, two things, if you ever poured gasoline on your hands, it feels cold. So when you spray gasoline through a carburetor jet, it cools things down. And if you go through the Venturi, you pick up the speed of the air going there, that cools things down. Most cars don't have any problem with that because everything's inside the hood, right beside the engine, getting all the heat from the engine. In this case, this is out in the breeze and, uh, and it will ice up enough to stop the engine. So we're a little cautious about relative humidity. If the relative humidity is high, you get, it's easy to get ice in there. <coughs> okay, the other thing is there's no balance. You'll note that the rudder, let's take a look at it here, you can call it run. It does not pivot at the front. It, it pivots about 20 degrees behind. That's a slightly what's called balanced rudder. The elevator and ailerons have no balance. So we expect relatively heavy controls. That was worn out, they are. <laughs> um, and because of, of the characteristics of the wing, as I said, we're really going to stay away from stall flight, high angle attack flight, if at all possible. Okay, and uh, Actually, he did a little bit of prediction, but the test pilot didn't pay enough attention to his own predictions. And it's a little hard to explain, but uh, crank the ailerons over. Okay? You note the down aileron is actually trying to lift this wing, but it's also trying to drag it back. Just like sticking your hand out the window of the car. It's trying to bring it back. The up aileron, you think, well, I ought to be bringing it back too, but it's going up into air that's not as dense. So it doesn't do that. And airplanes all tend, if you just do this or this, make the nose go, if you turn left, the nose will go right. If you wait long enough, it'll turn around and go. But the, the first instance is what they call adverse yaw. It yaws off in the opposite direction that you wanted it to go. And sure enough, this does. <laughs> uh, a lot more than I thought it was going to. 
and you're sitting out in front. Okay, uh, we'll go on to that later. <laughs> so our plan on a test flight was to get to the end of the runway, just pop off the ground, fly level, go down, and land, and just just get a feel for control. We'll see what things were going to look like and how things are going to feel. The expectation was that when you rotate, it wants to go more. So as you pull back, as soon as the thing comes off, you have to go forward quickly on the, on the stick or the control. And that turned out to be true. And once again, the test pilot was that much too slow. I almost nailed it, but it overshot just a little. And I came back down and got it. So that went OK. But we expected that it was going to overshoot on pitch. So, but, uh, you can come on up and take a look at some of these things and, and you note that a lot of the strength of this airplane is wires um, and compression struts of wood and tension in wires and the story goes that if you get in there with a chicken, let the chicken go, if it gets out, you don't have enough wires in there yet. <laughs> <laughs> and there, uh, boy, there are lots of them. <laughs> so, I talk about the flight. So we got to the end of the runway. Turns out that, uh, as you can see, we've got brakes on this thing, which is unusual. And they're actually fairly effective. They're, and they'll almost hold the thing at full throttle if you don't let it start to move a little bit. If, you, if it starts to move, then you can't stop it. But if it's not moving, it'll almost hold full throttle. The nose wheel does not steer. So getting the airplane out takes a crew of two back here to pick you up and turn you around and point you the right direction down, up, back and forth until you get onto the end of the runway. So we got the engine going fairly well, got out to the end of the runway. It was a fairly light day. And I think, uh, as I pointed out to somebody else, that crosswinds, when you're going 20 miles an hour, a five mile an hour crosswind is noticeable. A five mile an hour crosswind at 100 miles an hour, you don't even know it's there. Uh, we definitely were not going 100 miles an hour with this. So, so start down the runway, uh, and the airplane jumped off the ground a little bit sooner than the test pilot anticipated, and instantly took off to the right. So. It was too late to close the throttle and put it back on the runway because the runway wasn't under it anymore. So that's not that option went out the window. Cranked the ailerons over and got this adverse yaw that I talked about, which made the nose go even further to the right. And uh, sooner or later, these things come through to the, the brain cells and oh man, I got to get something going here, like maybe a little left rudder, and uh, and. I'll just let you look at the, I got things mixed up, you can see some of the pictures of us. Again, starting at the wrong end. There, we're starting down the runway. So first, getting it lined up. Coming off the ground and going off to the right. And here we are starting to come back around, pointing toward the runway. The maximum altitude was probably 40 feet. No, you're far enough you don't want to fall that far. <laughs> and the pitch control turned out to be better than, than I had anticipated. It, it was uh, fine, not, not given instability in, in pitch, but we didn't change airspeed very much. So the unstable pitch would not manifest itself until we pick up airspeed and see it. But as it goes faster, I'm expecting the nose to want to go down. And then we have to correct that a little bit. As it goes slower, it's going to want to come back up. Um, if we got back over the runway, I went to about three quarter throttle and just flew down until it was touched on and landed. Landed just about three point, very smooth landing, closed the throttle, and then had to add power to get to the end of the runway. 
So obviously we're not going very fast. I think we can come off the ground at about 25 to 30. At, at uh, climb speed, we're probably going 35, 25 or 30, yeah, maybe 35. Uh, and that may be near top speed. You know. And uh, once it got going, why well, then, uh, as soon as the test pilot figured out he had to use the rudder, why well, it flew around and close flew nicely. As a result of that flight, come back in, measured some things on the wing, and realized that the right wing had what they called washout, which means that it's tipped down like so at the tip compared with with the center section. So it's got less lift. This wing didn't have any washout. So it would give you a little more. Of it. So as a result of the test flight come back and tried to put some washout in this one and take some out of that one. And it, it didn't get as far as I would like, but I think we got about half of what was available there. The other thing is, if you look at these pictures coming around, you'll see that it appears that nobody quite knows where zero is on the ailerons. And I think they're both set down like this when they're neutral, when they should be like this. I prefer to have them up a little bit. but So the ailerons have been raised, and we've, we've taken some washout out of the right wing. We'll do that for the next next flight and see. And I'm sure it will improve. Uh, actually, it was flyable the way it was before. So I, I think we just made a few corrections that will make it a little more flyable. And shortly, we're going to open the door here and take this out and run, because I'd like to run the thing. With, we're continuing the test. I'd like to see what happens with a higher water temperature. So I'm going to run it with a piece of cardboard in front of the radiator. Typical truck driver winter trick. Uh, only we'll remember to take it off. Like truck drivers always forget, you know, in July, I wonder why they can't keep their truck cooled off. Uh, and see what happens to oil pressure with a higher, uh, higher water temperature. So come on closer and look at some of the stuff. Crowd, crowd on in. I, like I say, you can't. Some people claim you can't hurt them at all. I think you can if you work at it. You can do some damage. Remember that this is, that's cloth. Underneath is, well, in this case, it's a lie, but for all the other stuff, it's wood. These sort of things, cloth and wood. There's some metal in here, but we don't know about it. Um, and there's nothing, this is, you can do this airplane, it hasn't been done once already. It's been, everything's been changed three or four times, so if we crash, we can build it again. That's what they did many, many times before. We do have a rule. If we're going to crash, you want to skid the thing sideways so the engine goes off the one side instead of other than that. And it's a good crash. You get a one up and get a feel for how tight the set the wires, how heavy these controls are. Just go ahead and move them. Yeah, those are pretty. Yeah. 